Hello and welcome to Curious Minds again. This is Evan Van Sickle here at the Christian Student Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hope you're having an amazing time. I know it's kind of like the lamest part of the year. It's after Christmas, but it's not spring, and it's been dark outside for way too long. But hey, maybe we can shine a little sunshine on things. So today we're going to learn about how to wash your hands properly in such a way where germs do not spread a virus from person to person. The flu in why to stay... No, no. Sorry. Looking at the wrong document here. Ah, here we go. Today we're going to learn about Islam some more. I've critiqued the claim of accuracy and inspiration of the Quran over the last few weeks. The Quran did not come through consistently with the high claims made about it. Since the claims coming from Islam are so drastic, I have to critique it more harshly than I would a regular document from that era. While there's still so much that I don't know about the Quran, I learned enough to be able to conclude that the Quran failed most, if not all, of the seven tests that I applied to it. Now we're going to step from that to a theological examination of Islam. So this can include the Quran, and certainly will, but it'll also include other Muslim thinkers, Christian thinkers, the Bible, and sound logic and philosophy as I see it. So there's ten that I have right now in theology. We're not going to hit all of them, I think we'll hit half of them. we got the four omnis, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, omnitemporal, the immutability, imminence versus transcendence, the holiness, goodness, love, and justice. Those are the ten theological topics, especially as they relate to Islam and Christianity. So let's describe some of these, because those probably sounded like some very heavy theological terms, and they are, but we can make some sense out of those. I would say all four omnis can relate to what is determined about God from the cosmological argument. Now that was a while ago. You're welcome to go back and listen to it. Let me do a quick recap because it'll help clarify the omnis here. God's the creator of all things that exist. Muslims and Christians agree on that. Atheists don't agree on that, so there's an argument for God's existence called the cosmological argument that says all things that begin to exist or all dependent things need a cause. They need some prior force that brings about their existence. Okay, the universe began to exist. It is dependent Therefore, the universe had a cause sufficient to bring about what we have here in the universe. Now, the universe is made up of time, space, and matter. Therefore, that which brought the universe about is not time-bound, is not material, and is immeasurable. From this, we deduce God as a necessary being, that which doesn't need a prior cause, because he is the prime mover, the ultimate cause in himself. But if God needs no prior cause to his existence and necessarily exists, that means at any potential location, God exists in the same way in all those spaces. Now, that's a whole lot to say to get to God's omnis, but I think it makes sense of it. First one, omnipresent. God is omnipresent. Since God is a necessary being, it's impossible that he not exist. Therefore, any space would possess the presence of this God. So not measurable by space. That also means that God does not have these individual parts. He doesn't have a physical hand. All these things are proverbial when they're communicated in Scripture. And we'll talk a little more about this when we reach imminence versus transcendence, but let me throw a teaser out there. God's presence is not in all places in the same way. It's there in a way that allows evil to take place where God is not responsible for the evil. So nothing's entirely separated from God, but nothing that we see is in itself God. All right, omnipresence. Second is omnipotence. Omnipotence seems to flow from omnipresence combined with having the capability to be the creator. So if God has any capability and he is omnipresent, this makes his capability limitless. The positive attribute of omnipotence is that God is able to do anything. And of course, this runs into conundrums because some will say, can God create a rock so large that he can't lift it? If he can't make that rock, then he's not all powerful. If he can make that rock, he's not omnipotent because he can't lift it. Either way, he's not omnipotent. Does that mean it's impossible for God to be omnipotent? This is where the negative view of omnipotence comes in. Omnipotence implies that one does not do that which exhibits weakness. It's about God having the power to do all positive things, all things that are within his perfect will. Nothing can restrain God from doing the things that he has planned. 
That's an accurate view of omnipotence. Now, is creating a rock that large within God's plan? Well, no. Plus, a rock that large is a self-contradictory concept, since in order to lift something, you have to be able to pull the object away from something larger, and this rock would be the largest possible thing. So, anyway... Omnipotence combines the omnipresence and power and is guarded by the will of God. Three, omniscience. If you know the word science, that means knowledge. Omniscient is all knowledge. Positively, God knows the truth and the right thing for every situation. And this also flows from omnipresence. If God is everywhere and is a mind, then there is nothing outside the perspective of his mind. And this might run into some conundrums, too, where someone might point out, well, does omniscience mean that God knows what it is to be a sinner? Does he know what it feels like to stub his toe? Well, again, it's a later point, but on God's goodness, we have to couple omniscience with goodness and ask, what is a good thing to know? Any possible positive thing to know, God knows eternally. Stubbing a toe, does that combine with omnipotence and omnipresence? No, God does not have a toe, and he does not exhibit weakness. So stubbing a toe is a measure of exhibiting weakness, and so is any sensation of what it feels like to be a sinner. That is negative knowledge, that is false knowledge, that is knowledge that reflects weakness, not powerful, omnipresent, perfect knowledge, as God would have. Now another question, which I I'm working on, but I don't quite have the definitive answer for. If God is omniscient, does that mean he knows all if-then scenarios or what some call counterfactuals? Does God know what would happen given any set of circumstances? William Lane Craig and plenty of others would say, yeah, sure. God knows every possible counterfactual. I don't think so. I think this creates an infinite set problem. For instance, what would the world be like if there was one more grain of sand on earth and another one and another one? It could go on literally forever. One problem is that this seems unlike the perfect mind of God. Why would God have knowledge of something that could never take place? Second, philosophers typically consider an infinite set to be impossible, yes, even as it relates to the mind of God. So I think omniscience is only practical and actual with God, rather than an exhaustive set of counterfactual possibilities. So from omniscient, the fourth omni, omnitemporal, or timelessness, God is timeless. If God is the creator of time, as the cosmological argument says, then he himself is not bound by time. Time is something that is only relative to the changes and movements that take place within matter, within creation. It is based on finite space, and since God is not necessarily a part of that, we would say that God is not within time or bound by time. He does not age. He was not younger 3,000 years ago. He's always had the same amount of knowledge, since he's omniscient, and he does not progress across time in a way that would mean he learns. So that's the four omnis. God's omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnitemporal. And fifth, God is immutable. This should make sense out of some of the previous. Immutable meaning God does not change. That is the essential nature of God does not change. So we have examples of God changing. We'll get to those in a minute. But immutability would say that the essential nature of God does not change. That is not necessarily how God acts, but who God is. The essential nature. Think about it. If God changed, one of the previous omnis would have to be compromised. Change would imply a move towards something greater or towards something lesser. People change because they seek to improve. They go from a state of weaker to stronger, or a state of less knowledgeable to more knowledgeable. God does not make these transitions. God is perfectly knowledgeable and perfectly powerful. So here's the five. God is omnipresent, that means everywhere. God is omnipotent, that means all-powerful. God is omniscient, all-knowing. God is omnitemporal, that means he is timeless or outside of time. And God is immutable, that is changeless, no need to change. So that's the philosophical approach. Let's look at what the Quran says regarding each of these. As I was preparing for this, I did a little word study in the Quran of when it says God is. God is shows up 479 times in my modern English version of the Quran. This is close to one half of the times that the term God, Allah, is used. That's just to point out that the Quran is very much a book that is interested in the characteristics, the nature of God. 
Now back to the five attributes, God's omnipresence. All right, tried to show it logically a few minutes ago, and now to test that against the Islamic belief, Muslims definitely believe in the omnipresence of God, and it shows up pretty clearly there in Surah 2, verse 115. To God belong the east and the west. Whichever way you turn, there is God's presence. God is omnipresent and omniscient. Well, there you go. He knocked two out with one stone there. God is omnipresent. God is everywhere, according to the Quran, according to Islamic belief. How about omnipotence? All powerful couple references to that here in Surah 3, verse 189. To God belongs the sovereignty of the heavens and the earth. God has power over all things. In Surah 220, still, had God willed, he could have taken away their hearing and their sight. God is capable of everything. God is everywhere, and God is all-powerful, according to the Quran. Now, what, what is the extent of that power? I assume it's very similar to what I talked about a few minutes ago, and I think we would have a very rich conversation about the scope of God's presence and power. And his knowledge, which is number three. As I read just a moment ago, Surah 2, verse 115, refers plainly to God's omniscience. And this is on display in a couple areas, too. God knows what is in the human heart, according to Surah 3, verse 119. And in 5... 97, God knows everything in the heavens and the earth, and God is cognizant of all things. And in Surah 42.11, he's the originator of the heavens and the earth. There is nothing like him. He is the hearing, the seeing. So God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-present, according to the Quran. No real problem so far in theology when comparing what I had gone over earlier. What about timelessness? Well, it stays consistent there, too. God is omnitemporal. I did not find a verse in the Quran about this. That's not to say that there isn't one. I just haven't found one yet. But seekersguidance.org says this, Allah Most High is transcendent above any quality of his creation, including existing within time or space, as that would entail being limited. So God does not exist within time because that would be a limitation. God is timeless. All right, four for four. How about the fifth one? Immutability. Does God change according to the Islamic theology? I'm not sure what change implies overall, but from what I understand, Muslims say that God is immutable, does not change, nor can anything change him. The Quran had a few verses related to this, didn't see a plain, plain teaching on it. It says that there is no change in God's words, Surah 6, 34. There's no change in God's system, according to 33, 62. There's no change in God's practice, according to 3543, and there's no change in God's pattern, according to 4823. Does God change? Didn't see examples of him changing, only saw examples of non-change. So, five for five, the Islamic teaching lines up with what I would consider a Christian philosophy from natural theology. Let's go to the Bible also to show the level of agreement here between the Islamic teaching on these five points of theology and the biblical teaching. God's omnipresence. Psalm 139.7 poetically describes God's omnipresence. Where can I go from your spirit? Can I go down into death, into the depths? No. Can I go to the highest heavens? No. Your presence is everywhere. Jeremiah 23.4 says it a little more plainly. Don't I feel heaven and earth? So there's nowhere you can hide from me. I feel heaven and earth. Omnipresence. There's no escaping God's presence. And in 2 Chronicles 2.6, the highest heavens cannot contain him, implying how could you ever build a house for God? How can the temple ever really house him? Well, the point wasn't to house the omnipresence of God. It was to create a space of particular manifestation of his presence. So omnipresence is a biblical concept. It's a Quranic concept. and It's a sound philosophical concept. How about omnipotence? Is God all-powerful? The entire Bible calls God the Almighty 58 times. According to 1 Timothy 6.15, it calls God the blessed and only sovereign. Revelation itself has it nine times. In Revelation 11.17, it says, We thank you, Almighty God. That's Pantocrato, the ruler of all things. So God's omnipresent and omnipotent and also omniscient, according to the Bible. God knows all things, according to Isaiah 40, 28. It says his understanding is inscrutable, no flaws in God's ability to understand. I find it interesting here that the Bible uses understanding and not just knowledge. I think that's a twist on the applicability 
taking ownership of the things that are known and not just having head knowledge. So I think the, the biblical description here is that God's beyond head knowledge. The things that he knows are also close to his heart. Psalm 147.5 says that God has infinite understanding. And then Isaiah 46.10 which you may remember from last week. We talked about prophecy. It says that God declares the end from the beginning. So the knowledge is not just exhaustive knowledge of the moment, but exhaustive knowledge from the beginning to the end, across all time. Implying, then, that God would be omnitemporal, right? Yes. That's why Revelation, again, says God referring to himself as the Alpha and the Omega, who was, who is, and who is to come. And then Revelation 21.6 says that he's the beginning and the end, as it said in Isaiah 46.10. So we have this blending of God being outside of time and knowledgeable, therefore the knowledge is prophetic in nature. And as I described last week, this prophetic knowledge is confirmed in the Bible, but not in the Quran. Even though they both promote the idea. And the fifth one, is God immutable? Or does God change? Now, there's a couple theological perspectives that especially center on this point. Open theists would say, yes, God changes and progresses across time. He learns as he goes along. He does not know what a person will do in the future, but he can control and dictate how that person decides. Some might point out, in defense of this open theist view, the idea that the Lord changes his mind, such as in Exodus 32:14. So what's going on here is that Moses is kind of quarreling with God, and the Lord is angry against the people. Moses intercedes, saying, Lord, please don't deal harshly with these people. See us in light of the gracious promise you made to us, not in terms of what our actions deserve. And then in 14 it says, So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Well, there you go. Case closed. God's not immutable. He changes his mind, according to the Bible. Well, not so fast. Psalm 55:19 says that with God there is no change. Okay, no change, but he changed his mind before. We've got a puzzle. We've got a paradox. All right, let's go to Psalm 102, 26 and 27. This reemphasizes God's immutability. The psalmist says, They will perish. That's all finite things. But you, God, will endure like clothing they wear out, but God does not. And then he says, but you are the same and your years will not come to an end. And there's other verses that emphasize God's immutability, his changelessness. And there are other verses that seem to imply that God changes something based on an intercessor or a prayer. So what's going on here? Does God change or does he not? Well, the best that I can do with this is actually disagree with the open theists and say that God does not change his mind, but when we consider that much of the Bible is recorded from human perspective, it helps make sense of these passages. So the Lord is not changing his mind from his perspective in Exodus 32, 14. The Lord is changing his mind according to Moses' perspective. How do you make sense of prayer unless this were the case in some sense? Now, that's not to say that the Lord changes, nor does he change his will according to a person's prayer. But the person's prayer is the means through which God has decreed and known infinitely beforehand that a certain thing will take place. So what he's saying to Moses in that Exodus passage is that had you not prayed and interceded, God would have carried out the judgment against the people. But in light of Moses interceding, praying, and imploring God on behalf of the people, God did not bring about the punishment of the people. Now, God had known beforehand that Moses would do that prayer, but still revealed to Moses that this punishment would take place if no intercession takes place. Moses intercedes, and God, from Moses' perspective, changes his mind in light of the prayer that's being prayed. And it was according to the prayer. It's just a prayer that God knew Moses was going to pray. And I picture it like a pop can. When you look at a pop can and it's not moving, you may only see a vertical rectangle. But as your perspective of it changes, maybe the can is being tilted down towards you until you only see a circle. Now, your best way of describing it may be it went from a rectangle to a circle. It changed. But did the pop can change? No, it didn't. The only thing that changed was your perspective, your angle on the pop can. The reason that praying to God changes things is not because God changes. It's more that the response from God is appropriately different in light of the fact that you asked, that you sought God about it. It is appropriate for a friend, for instance, to give another friend food to eat, 
but if he breaks into his friend's house and steals some food, it insults the friendship and betrays trust. When we humble ourselves before God and communicate dependence on him, that makes the answer to prayer proper when it was not proper before. Such was the case with Moses in Exodus 32. The reason I'm spending so much time clarifying this is because there is a domino effect if one of these theological points is compromised. If immutability is sacrificed here, then omnitemporality must be thought of differently, which would alter how we should think of God's omnipotence, his power. But if immutability is as I have just described, then the omnis remain consistently intact. Plus, it seems to make the best sense of the biblical paradox. So these are the five, according to the Bible, that are attributes of God, I would say essential attributes of God. God is omnipresent, God is omnipotent, God is omniscient, He is omnitemporal, and He is immutable. In other words, God is everywhere, He has all power, He has all knowledge, He exists outside of time, and He does not change in His essential nature. The Quran seems to agree with this. Sound philosophy and a careful look at the cosmological argument also emphasizes this. Now, this is a section on theology, a Muslim-Christian comparison. These are the agreeable points. I think we'll find maybe a couple other agreeable points down the road. As we progress through the nature of God, we'll run into a couple very important differences. I believe these differences are a real problem for Islamic theology, as they lead to a far different soteriology, that is, view of salvation. So they can't be ignored or glossed over. Just because there will be points of strong disagreement, that doesn't mean that every claim about the characteristics of God is wrong by association. And just because many of the essential attributes of God are in harmony between the two views, this does not mean that there is not room for strong disagreement. So that's where things are heading. But for this one, hey, nice and agreeable for once, huh? Now, I want you to know that this God, this omnipresent omniscient, is as close to you as you can imagine and closer. And I would implore you to press in to the existence of this God. Press into who he is. There is no greater being that you can know about, and there's no greater use of your time than to know God. This is our destiny. This is why he created us. He created us to know him and to be in right fellowship with him. So I want to urge any listener to know God. Figure out who he is, who you are, who you are in relation to him, and how to perfect that connection with him. I argue that that perfection is only bridged by Jesus, the God-man, who is gracious so that we can have right standing before God and that we can intimately know our creator, our omnipresent, omnipotent, perfect creator. Won't you press into knowing him? And let's talk more down the road. Next time we'll continue to attribute 6 through 10 in comparing Christian and Islamic theology. Until then, may God bless and guide you.